welcome everyone from all over our country uh, to our Stardust mission and virtual tour of NASA's Stardust Curation Lab. We are broadcasting to you from the NASA Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. This is where we curate all of NASA's astromaterials collections, including our Stardust samples. There are 22 states participating, and we've had registrations from folks in Mexico and Australia as well. So maybe you see yourself on the map here. Uh, we've got groups that we're so happy again that you're joining us. Students in grades one through 12, so we hope we're gonna make this in as understandable for everyone as possible. Mike is great, so I know he's gonna be able to do that, as are our other featured speakers. So aside from Mike, we have Carla Gonzalez, Melissa Rodriguez, Ron Bastian, and we are very lucky to have them with us today. They are busy people, they work in a very interesting lab, which you can see on my slide here as well. And this is the first time we're sharing them and our Stardust Curation Lab with all of you. So we're so glad you could join us. Future webinars, you can always check our website. But without further ado, we want to get started with Mike and an overview of our mission. So with that, I'm going to turn things over to Mike. Okay, well, I uh, hope you can hear me. Um, you probably know that astronauts brought lunar samples back from the moon like 40 years ago, uh, and that we have meteorites from Antarctica here. But we also have samples from a comet just across the hall from where we are right now talking. And take a word for it, those are the most interesting samples. Forget lunar samples, forget meteorites, they're boring. The comet samples are the most exciting. That's a matter of opinion, by the way. It's, it's, it's true. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the reason is that the comets preserve our best record of the early solar system, uh, how things were uh, before the planets formed. And we also think, we're pretty sure that comets brought a lot of the materials in your body, maybe all of it, to the Earth. All the carbon, a lot of the water came to Earth in dribs and drabs, a little bit at a time, in comets. And so, uh, that's why there's such a fascination with comets uh, amongst planetary scientists. So I want to talk to you briefly about this mission called the Stardust Mission, which was our first and so far only mission that visited a comet and then came back to Earth with samples which we can then examine and study and better understand in the lab. So uh, next slide. Thank you. Okay, so I'm not going to read any of the text. Um, basically, uh, Ooh, we, we, we are limited by uh, how fast our spacecraft can travel. And comets travel a lot faster. And so this mission was a seven year mission. It launched in 1999 and it went out to a comet. It took uh, five years to reach the comet because the spacecraft traveled around the sun three times, picking up speed as it went. So when we finally uh, passed the path of the comet in 2004, uh, we were going as fast as we possibly could, but even, even after all of that, the comet was traveling a whole lot faster. Um, it was going uh, past the spacecraft with a relative velocity of six kilometers per second. So it passed by our spacecraft so fast, that was like basically 10 times as fast as a rifle bullet travels. If you can imagine something that fast. So the, the real trick, the real challenge in this mission was how to capture samples of dust from the coma, the atmosphere of dust and gas surrounding the comet, how to capture that material without destroying that dust and without destroying the spacecraft. And I'll, I'll show you how we did that. But here we see pictures of the comet nucleus as you whiz by. It's only a few miles across, it's pretty small, but the cloud of dust and gas around that comet was millions of miles across. So we basically whiz through this uh, cloud of dust and gas around the comet uh, Pack picked up some dust in a catcher's mitt, which contained this fluffy stuff called silica aerogel. And then the catcher's mitt in the spacecraft closed up, and the spacecraft returned to Earth in 2006, which is a long time ago for you. It seems like a short time for me. So this mission, we started working on it 25 years ago. It took a really long time to get it going. It was a seven-year mission, and now it's been more than 10 years since it came back. And this slide shows the spacecraft streaking through the sky, crashing back to Earth in 2006. It happened in the early morning in wintertime in Utah. And this slide shows, 
Here's what's left. This is a capsule that came back with the samples laying on the ground. Um, picked it up, opened it up in the lab, and uh, we'll show you what we found inside the capsule in the lab in a few minutes. But this was super exciting. When this capsule entered the atmosphere, it was the fastest object ever recovered from space. Um, then we put it on an airplane, uh, which had four passengers. I was one of them. And the cargo of, of comet dust flew back here to Houston from Utah. And uh, late that night, we opened up the, the, the spacecraft and took out this, this Ketra's mitt, this tray of silica air gel, this real fluffy stuff that captured the comet dust. And we could easily see tracks in the air gel made by the comet dust. So these are microscopic grains of dust from the comet that smacked into the air gel, the Ketra's mitt, at really high velocity. And when they did that, as you'll see in the lab, they made these tracks going into the air gel. So we can look in the air gel, which is pretty transparent. It's like glass. And you can see these little tracks, like little arrows pointing to the comet samples. So it's very, very exciting. So you'll see people here, they're wearing these white outfits. Me wondering, gee, why are you wearing these white outfits? Uh, it's not because they're getting married or anything. It's because these are outfits you wear in a very, very clean laboratory. This laboratory, because we're studying dust from the comet, what you don't want to do is bring in dust from your body or from the air or outside uh, into the lab so you can get confused with the comet dust. So this laboratory is a special clean room. And in fact, it's about 10 times cleaner than the operating room in a hospital. That's how clean it is. So uh, we're wearing these bunny suits. And uh, this shows the tray of air gel about the size of a tennis racket. And you'll see it in the lab in a few minutes. And each of these little uh, bluish little cells here look like ice cubes, an ice cube tray. Those are the silica air gel, which is a super light fluffy material, which captured the comet dust. And the, as you see here, you can't see anything. You can't see any tracks in the air gel at all because the tracks are really tiny because the captured grains are, are microscopic. So the challenge is to find the tracks in the air gel, which you do with microscopes, and then carve out the tracks, contain the particles uh, with special tools, which you'll see in a few minutes in the lab. And uh, uh, this shows a little bit about the air gel. On the, le on the left side, you see a hand holding a piece of air gel. It's so light, you really can't feel it in your hand at all. It's the lightest material known. It's, uh, but it's, it's, despite that, it's amazingly strong. On the right side, you see a brick sitting on top of the air gel, and it isn't destroying the air gel. So although the air gel is lighter than a piece of paper or a cotton ball, it's very, very strong against uh, this kind of compression from a brick. And it had to be that strong to survive being launched in a spacecraft and crashing back to the ground uh, seven years later. And uh, this next slide just shows a few views of some of these air gel ice cubes, so to speak, with tracks in them. And on the left, you can see, upper left, you see a little hole there, kind of a fuzzy hole. Uh, and that's the outside of the hole made by a piece of comet grain entering the air gel. And this is about an inch and a half across. So the, the particle here was actually pretty big. You probably could see it with your eyeballs almost. On the right, another track, you see a hole in the air gel. And on the lower right, you see side views of some of these tracks made by the comet grain. So they, they entered at the top where the arrow is right now. They kind of broke apart and made this big hole in the air gel. Then the, the particles carried on down. It made this little, like a little tail in the bottom pointing downward. At the very bottom of these little tracks are the captured comet grains. And so these, you might wonder why these holes are so large when the captured grains are so small. And we think the reason is that these grains contain water and organics. And when they hit the air gel, they kind of explode it. And all those real volatile materials uh, were turned into vapor. And only the hardest grains in the samples managed to survive that collision with the air gel and smash the way down to make these tracks. Um, Next slide. So this shows a view of a, an upper, on the top, it's a view of a microscope uh, looking down into the air gel. Look at all the analysis, all the analyses and all the handling under microscopes because the samples are so darn tiny. Uh, and you see a little uh, a metal tool on the right coming in. There's a little needle sticking out of there. That's like a little sewing needle. And it goes in and it, it picks out a tiny little triangle of the air gel shown in the lower left here. Uh, and at the very bottom of this air gel is a little track made by comet dust. 
And so a convenient way of removing these grains for analysis is to pick out a little triangle of air gel, only about a millimeter in size. It's really tiny. Uh, and then you can then easily handle it, carry it, transport it to laboratories around the world uh, without losing the grains, which are, again, really tiny. They're microscopic. Uh, and that's your last slide. Okay. So Mike, to reiterate, so the motivations for this mission were to collect uh, particles from this comet and return them to Earth. Is that correct? That's right. And, you know, a lot of things don't work the first time you try them. And we spent a lot of time designing this mission and working on it, you know, 15 years. And amazingly, everything worked great. It was just a, almost a miracle, really. You know, a lot of spacecraft explode or they crash to Earth or they never get launched or it gets canceled. Listen, everything, everything worked. It was just an amazing thing. And so because of this, uh, scientists around the world uh, in more than 25 countries have been studying these samples for the last decade. And uh, I might say that when the spacecraft returned to Earth, we had uh, five scientists working for many years on this mission. Uh, a year later, there were more than 300 scientists analyzing the samples in all, on all continents, except Antarctica, uh, and, and making important discoveries about the early solar system from these samples. So these pristine samples of dust, these microscopic samples of dust, they really can provide a lot of insight into the history of our evolution and even our planets are, are themselves. Is that correct? That's right. Much more than lunar samples of meteorites. Much more than lunar samples. Not that he's biased in any way. Um, so we, we, you have this context now of the Stardust mission, it went to a comet, why it went to a comet, um, and actually, do, do you have an idea before we actually take you in the lab how much dust has been captured overall? Can you quantify that? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a few thousand grains of dust, and they're almost all microscopic, and so if you had them all in your hand at the same time, you could just barely see the little pile of dust grains there, and you wouldn't be able to feel the weight at all. Uh, so it's a very tiny return of sample in terms of the amount of mass, of weight, uh, but the return of information from these samples has been immense. And in fact, you know, I'll say now that when we, we designed this mission, we had some, some ideas, pretty good ideas, we thought about what comet dust would be like, and we learned from the samples. It turns out all of those ideas were wrong. Almost all of them were totally wrong, which is just great because it would have been a really boring mission if we got samples back and they were exactly what we expected. Instead of that, they were super surprising, uh, which has been just the most amazing experience. And so everyone working in these samples is very, very excited. And I'll say now, so don't, don't forget to say later on, that we brought these samples back for you guys. I mean, they're across the hall, they're being preserved in extremely clean conditions so that when you're out of school and planetary scientists and you're looking for samples to study, they'll be here ready for you and uh, you'll be able to take them on and take over them uh, and when you're a scientist. And I'll be have long retired by then. But they'll <laughs> still be here. And that's the point of having samples back in the lab is that for generations to come, the samples are there. So when new ideas arise, new techniques come about to study them, uh, we, can, we can do those things with these samples. We haven't uh, lost them, thrown them away, anything else. They're carefully preserved for you. That's awesome. So seeing pictures on a slide is one thing. Seeing things for real is another. So with that, first of all, Mike, thanks for the overview. He's going to go off into another room now, and he's going to sort of change the way he looks uh, because he's got to get prepared to go into our Stardust Lab, where, again, we collected samples from Comet Milt 2. Even though it looks like Wild 2, the way you pronounce it is built to. So while Mike is getting ready to go over and get ready to go into the lab, um, we're going to actually go to our lab and I'm going to, let's see if I can do this with the right mouse. I'm going to pin and spotlight a video because we want to see. Yes, not yet, now it is. <laughs> So we're going to make um, our little video live. You can see Mike as he's entering in. And Mike is going to be getting dressed. But while he's doing that, we're also going to let our other folks out there introduce themselves and let them know who they are. So, Carla and folks, 
introduce yourselves while we're getting ready to start here. Hi, my name is Carla Gonzalez. Um, I have a degree in biochemistry. I went to the University of Houston. I started working here as an intern at, at, in the research department, and now I'm in creation. So that's a quick summary of, of me. <laughs> so here's my coworker, Ron. Hi, I'm Ron Bastion. I'm the uh, lab manager for the Stardust Lab and also for the uh, Hayabusa Lab, the uh, uh, Raman Lab, and the Cosmic Dust Lab, and also the facility manager for this building. Welcome to our webinar. And thank you so much. And also who I have here is uh, Melissa, and I want Melissa to introduce herself as well. So Melissa, so they can see oh, you there. Hi, I am Melissa Rodriguez. Um, I've been working in the Stardust Lab since 2012, and it's a fun place to be. Awesome. Thank you, Carla. <laughs> thank you, Melissa. Uh, Melissa, this is a small lab, so only a few people can fit in there at a time, and so uh, Carla and Ron, can you let us know what's going on there with Mike? Mike is in the process of changing out uh, into his clean room outfit. He's putting on his uh, uh, nitrile gloves right now. Pretty soon he'll look just like us. He won't be able to tell us apart. And so how long does it generally take someone to get dressed? Uh, approximately five minutes. So since Mike's an expert at this, it might take him a little bit of a shorter time. And folks out there, you can see uh, where he entered. It's a pretty small room and he's got to get uh, dressed up and ready to go before he's able to share the real stuff with you there. So. Uh, um, so maybe before we actually go into any strong details, can you give us sort of an idea of what's in this room? Tell us a little bit about this room overall. All right. What you're looking at here is our uh, keystoning system. This is where we extract the sample. And we are actively extracting a sample right now. I'm not sure that. You can see the small beetle that Mike alluded to earlier. It's actually poking holes in it right now, making trying to cut out a very large crack. So, folks out there, if you can see, that's one of those aerogel blocks. And if they move that camera up ever so slightly, you can see those very fine needles that they're using. Uh, it's a little, oh, uh, you can see that aerogel uh, and these very fine needles that they use to extract this. So this is one part of the lab. What, what else, can you pan the room so we can see what else is in there? So this is the keystoning area. Okay, so this is where our storage cabinets that we keep all of our samples in. Every sample is accounted for. This large stainless cabinet you see here looks like a refrigerator. It holds uh, the interstellar tray in the bottom and the commentary tray at the top. And then this system over here is where we actually remove the tiles from the tray. And in a few minutes, we'll expose the uh, commentary tray so you can see what it looks like for real instead of taking. So it's not a very big lab and we actually, um, I'm going to see what he's opening up here. So those are extracted tiles from the tray. Okay. 
Now, we had a quick question from Lafayette Junior Senior High School about as clean as this lab is, as you have mentioned, how do you make sure the glasses, the video cameras, how do you make sure that they're all dust free? Every piece of equipment that comes in here gets wiped down with alcohol wipes prior to entering. So we bring our my glasses or another uh, microscope or even your cell phone in here. We have to wipe it down prior to enter, uh, bringing it into the lab or we leave it outside. Mm -hmm. and yes, and we have technicians that come in on uh, a weekly basis and they monitor the air quality of this room for uh, particulates. And generally, uh, this, this room meets um, what they call a class 10 particles uh, per cubic foot clean room. Uh, it's classified as a class 100, but it's cleaner than that. So again, it's about the... It's anywhere. Oh, oh, yeah, it's about the lab's about 10 times as clean, cleaner than an uh, operating room in a hospital. So you literally eat off the floor, and you'd be uh, uh, eating off of something that's actually cleaner than you'd seen in operating room. So we don't eat off the floor very often, actually. Yeah, but mine does. <laughs> Just sometimes. But uh, Carla actually, would never do that, right, yeah. Carla? <laughs> so the trick of this before was is to keep the samples very, very clean, so we have to not contaminate with dust uh, before you guys uh, can grow up, uh, become planetary scientists, and then come here to either work or analyze the samples. Our job, our job is to make sure that they're still as clean 10, 20, 30, 40 years from now as they were when they came back from the comet in 2006. Now, I know usually we can hear Mike really well, but when Mike is talking, maybe we can try to have Mike project a little bit more so that we can make sure we can hear you. We can, but you're slightly muffled every once in a while. So what are you guys going to show us next? So, so next we'll open up the, is that better? Next we'll open up the, uh, and show you the commentary tray. Um, so this is, uh, this is got to be the tray. Can you hear me? Yes, no? Yes. Okay, this will be the, this will be the tray that captured the comet dust. Uh, and a few minutes ago, Ron uh, mentioned that we have a second drink here in the lab as well. And uh, this mission, the Stardust mission, actually was two missions in one. Uh, the main goal was to capture comet dust grains and turn them up for, for study on the Earth. But we also captured interstellar dust grains, grains from other stellar systems, other solar systems, and other stars that are passing through our solar system. And those were in a second tray, which is also in this lab. So we actually have two kinds of of ash materials in the lab. Both of these are unique samples that are only found here. So we have samples of the early solar system in this commentary tray that Mont's raising up right now. We also have in a cabinet behind us samples of other solar systems, other stars, that it tells about how other solar systems form in addition to ours. So this is the commentary tray. And, uh, as you can see, uh, about half of the cells have been removed from the tray for study. But even after 10 years of having this tray back on Earth, half of the cells are still in the tray. We haven't even been cut. Again, again, the reason for that is to keep things really clean and uh, available for analysis in the future. So I'm going to the light around now, and uh, here and there you can see large the rats. Mike, I'm going to stop you for a real quick second here because uh, sound is so, so, I don't know if there's another um, microphone on the computer that could be turned on to try to help with the sound because every once in a while we get a, a little um, loss of the great things that you're saying. So uh, I don't know if, if there's another mic in the room to be turned on that might be helpful. 
Can you hear me fine? I could hear Ron a little bit better than I could hear Mike. Oh. Try shouting. There, I don't know if you have the camera pointed correctly. We're looking at a large crack in this file. And you're, you sound very low right now also, Ron. You're very hard to hear as well. And actually, the light away from that, I think we can see a little bit better. Can you hear better from here? Is this better? Yes, that's awesome. Okay, all right. So uh, Carla's pointing the light at the uh, yeah at, at uh, the tray, and uh, you see some. All right. Try to get this centered. Uh, that way. Yeah. Is that better? Yeah. So move the light back a little bit. That's good, right there, right there. So you see a white dot in one of the in the center of one of the cells, and that's uh, oh yeah, there was fingers pointing. That's a really really big comet grain that smacked into the tray and made an exceptionally large track. Uh, probably again, the whole track is only a few millimeters across, but that was a super gigantic, huge grain, uh, which will tell us a lot about the samples. But most of the tracks at at, at this scale you couldn't see at all. They're really tiny. Uh, but this lab is, is uh, it's designed to help us locate and extract uh, microscopic, really hard to find particles. That's what we're, that's what we're good at here. Um, so as you can see, uh, the air gel is pretty transparent, looks kind of milky, um, and it's extremely light. You can't see that, but you can, we can tell you about that. Uh, and that's uh, optimized so the particles are, are, have seen the least destruction during capture in the tray. Okay, right now they're on the far right. Pull up the light back a bit. I mean, yeah. Whoa. Get the light a little further away. Yeah, there you go. Uh, but the, yeah. We're trying to show you the largest impact in the tray. It's on the far right of your screen. Uh, it looks like a real dirty area on the upper right, uh, kind of you know, where the finger's pointing. Those are the two largest tracks made by particles that had smacked into the tray. Uh, they're easy to find, and again, we've saved those for the future. Uh, and we've only harvested really smaller tracks until now, again, with the goal of learning as much as we can about the samples and how to study them, and to preserve as much of the samples as we can for, for the future. Uh, okay, that's good. So here's a question that came in regarding these samples from Creekview High School. They're wondering, so how long does it take to extract the cometary dust particle from the aerogel? Yeah, so uh, first we pull the cell out of the tray, which takes about an hour or two. And then uh, it takes about a couple of days for this uh, system to go in and peck out a little triangle of aerogel. Uh, we call those keystones. Uh, and then that's it. I mean, uh, if, if the scientists request the samples, Say you request a cometary sample from us, and some scientists want an entire cell of aerogel with tracks still in it, so we just send it to them. Uh, some scientists want uh, one of these little triangles of aerogel, so in a couple of days we have that ready for them to go. But some scientists want uh, extremely highly processed samples. It might take us weeks to do. But for instance, one scientist wants us to take out some aerogel, uh, slice it in the thin little wafers, take those, crush them, put them in foil, et cetera, then pull the particles out. That could take us weeks and weeks. So it really depends on, um, on what the scientists need for their own analysis. Uh, some scientists like to do all the sample handling themselves. They have their own clean rooms. They can do that. Uh, for them, we're ready to go. They can get their samples in a few days. But many scientists don't only bother with handling microscopic particles, and they're happy to have us do all that for them. So this lab is set up to prepare the samples for all kinds of different analyses. So if you have an a, a analysis technique for analyzing a sample, but you have no skill or experience handling microscopic grains, we can prepare your samples for you and send them to you, 
and it'll take a lot longer. So uh, again, most of these scientists are here analyzing these samples for uh, months or years. So if they have to wait for a few days or a couple of months for the samples, that's okay. Um, and that's really the specialty of what our folks do out here is the preservation protection and then being able to distribute those samples. Now we had another question since it's related to Smith uh, to aerogel. Smith Elementary is wondering if this aerogel is 99.8% air, how is compression prevented and how is it so strong? How did it not break when the cometary particles entered or when you work with them there in the lab? Yeah, the answer is that uh, at, at, the, at the molecular level, the aerogel consists of tiny little balls of glass and the glass are, are welded together when it's manufactured. So though it's very, very light, and it's 99.999% you know, air, it's, it's strong against being crushed, being pushed together against compression. But in fact, it's very weak against being pulled apart. So uh, if you take it and rub it with your finger, you can, you, can, you can destroy it. If you try pressing it between your hands, it'll survive. So it's really optimized for uh, surviving the launch, which is a lot of compressive forces, and then the landing back on Earth, and then the capture of particles, again, that's mostly compressive forces. And so the air gel was really optimized to survive that. And I might also add that uh, in your lifetimes, people are going to be putting air gel in houses uh, for insulation, uh, between windows, to keep your houses nice and warm. Yeah, it's, nice it's insulation. yeah, spacecraft are already using those for insulation. Uh, in Europe, they're using uh, air gel to insulate homes already. It's, it's many times better insulator than anything you have in your home right now uh, because it can survive this compression uh, very well. So they're already using air gel uh, in, uh, in many ways on the earth as well as in spacecraft like this. Awesome, great. And I might also say that if you, if you wanna grow up and work in one of these labs, uh, you don't have to be super intelligent and smart, you have to be extremely calm. That's a really important thing. And so all the scientists working in the lab, Melissa, Carla, Ron, you know, we're, we're all pretty smart. Uh, we're not geniuses, but what we are is, is are very determined and extremely calm people because it could take a long time to sit and very carefully peel away layers of air gel and to pick up particles, move them around. Um, not everyone can do that. Uh, and if you can do that, if you like making models when you were a kid, I know I did, uh, that's a perfect uh, skill to develop later on to, to make into a career. So as a kid, I made lots of like models. I love doing that sort of thing. And that basically grew into what I do now. And if you talk to a lot of planetary scientists, when they were kids, they were, they loved to like work with uh, tools and, and small machines and toys and building things. That's a real common thing you'll find scientists like to do when they were younger. Okay, now, uh, yeah, Carla's showing the uh, a cell of aerogel removed from the tray. It's kind of too bright. Yeah. Still kind of too bright. Okay, that's good, right there. A little less, less even. Yeah. Uh, what they're trying to show now is a cell of air gel. It looks like a little uh, square of, of bluish smoke. It's still even that's too much light. Uh, can can see it? We think if you turn the light off, it might be helpful. That's Melissa's thought. Uh, you can bet. It's pretty dark. Did you want me to turn off the light? Yeah, please. So this is a cell of air gel. This cell, it flew from the Earth out to the comet oh, back. OK. And now you can see a giant track, it's obvious here, in this air gel. So the particle entered at the top of the cell, made this uh, bulb, uh, looks like a tadpole kind of, and then the, the hard grains continued on down, this little white track downward. Uh, so this one hasn't been removed from the cell yet. Uh, this was a rather large particle entering the, the sample. And here it's probably worth saying that, again, the reason we have this, this uh, this oval shaped cavity in the air gel that was made by the particle as it entered the air gel is because the particles contain a lot of water and organics. Uh, and we, we, like I said earlier that 
and we think comets brought a lot of the carbon and the water uh, in your bodies, in animals, plants, the oceans. That's where the Earth, that's where the water got, uh, how it came to Earth originally, in comets, grain by grain and, and, and rock by rock. And so uh, studying the organics and the water in these samples will tell us a lot about uh, the origin of water and organics in our solar system, uh, how and where they formed, and how they arrived at Earth. Now, I might say that one of the major discoveries from this mission was that there were amino acids uh, in the comet grains that were captured in the air gel. And we know that amino acids are one of the building blocks of life. These amino acids in these comets didn't form from, from animals or anything. There are no animals on comets. But the building blocks of animals are present in these comets. And they were captured by the grains returned on this mission. That's an amazing view of that track. I mean, earlier when you said this was microscopic and you can barely see this, this looks as clear as day. This is amazing. Now, aside from these amino acids that you said were discovered, um, one of our schools, Windsor Farm Elementary, was also wondering what other, let me see if I can find their question here. What, uh, where did it go, where did it go? Um, what other elements were found or what other types of materials were found in the dust? So uh, all the elements uh, found on Earth have been found in the comet grains. And we haven't found any new elements, for instance, in the comets that weren't, on, weren't found on the Earth already. But one of the really cool things we found, something that was not expected at all, is we see a lot of elements, a lot of compounds that form at very high temperatures very close to the sun. So if you think about it, you know, comets have uh, lots of organics, lots of water. They're, they're like half ice, right? They had to have formed very far from the sun where it's very, very cold, out, out beyond the planets, really. Uh, but somehow, the material in the comets formed right up next to the sun. And that was totally unexpected. Uh, we had thought, you know, kind of naively, that because the comets formed out far from the sun, all the things in the comet must have formed there too. And that was totally wrong. And what that means is there's some process that moved things from next to the sun when it was still forming out way out beyond where the planets are now, out to where the comets form. It's like a giant conveyor belt, moving material from the early sun and bringing it way out far from the sun where it could combine with things that were cold and like ice and make these comets. So that was a totally unexpected result from the mission that's caused everyone to rewrite all the books about early solar system, and we're just trying to understand that result. Uh, and so it means that instead of having materials that formed just far from the sun, this comet captured material that formed everywhere in the early solar system, far from the sun, out where the plants formed, even right up next to the sun itself. So it's a, a real hodgepodge of material from the entire early solar system. So it's pretty exciting. Yeah, so really it's telling us so much about our solar system as a whole, not just one small aspect of it, but really our solar system as a whole, which is um, really kind of helps make a difference in the scientific world and our understanding of it. Yeah, and about the same time these samples came back, uh, uh, astronomers began realizing that there was something really radically wrong with their models for the early solar system. And if you look in books, you see the planets forming out where they are now, around the sun, everything's great. But it turns out that what really happened was a lot of the giant planets formed far from the sun and then moved in up next to the sun and then moved back out again. They're actually moving back and forth, in and out. And uh, that seems to be happening in, in all the solar systems we're observing uh, by spacecraft. And so the early solar system was a very dynamic place much more complicated and active than we had thought. So now they're focusing on the microscope where uh, Ron and Carla are carving out a little triangle of air gel. Uh, I'm afraid it's not a focus yet, but uh, again, I mentioned that, you know, although you can see that one track very clearly, uh, the particles are microscopic even that, in that big track. And for the most part, we're using microscopes to observe the samples, and all the activity happens 
uh, when you're looking down a microscope. So you've got to be very calm and very slow and careful and methodical to do the analyses. Yeah, you're probably just too close. That's better. Yeah, this. I'm sorry this view is not so great. Uh, maybe just further away. I understand, yeah, but I think it won't focus that close. Uh, so in this view, you're actually trying to extract one of those triangle keystones that you showed in one of your slides. Is that what this is actually doing? So, uh, kind of zooming up and down on the left, you were. He's moving the camera around to get a better view. Uh, yeah, that's. Yeah, you really can't see what's going on there. So this view, you see it like a little uh, rectangular shaped line on the screen. That's the groove cut by a little needle in the air gel. And so as the needle moves up and down, it's slowly moving it back and forth across the air gel, carving out a little triangle of air gel. And so this little, this little uh, square shape with lines, that's actually the, the holes cut by the, the, the needle, the sewing needle, if you will, in the air gel. So this takes a couple of days to do for each track. And uh, Carla and Ron and Melissa are super skilled at doing this, this work. They're the, really the only ones in the world that can do this. Uh, Is that a good piece for you? Yeah. yeah. So again, it's a little hard to see here, but the needle moves back and forth across the air gel as it does. It's pulled by a computer. As it does, it's just cutting back and forth and carving out this uh, little piece of air gel. Now, what was that darker material on the side of that view? It almost looked like a dark blob. That's just the holder holding the cell. So that's right now you're looking at. She means the actual yeah, track, right? Uh, okay. Yeah, you see in the in the upper right of this image is kind of like a little gray flower. That's sort of. It's, it's as you're focusing up and down in the track, you can see this little flower moving. This is the track, the outline of the track in the air gel when we're carving out. And so now Ron's focusing the microscope up and down so you can see uh, this track. So it's a little round uh, gray shape on the upper right. As he focuses the scope up and down, you can see the walls of this, uh, of this track made by the cometary grain. So the walls are dark partly because there are bits of comet dust embedded in the air gel, but also partly because the air gel melted when the comet grains uh, passed through. So now he's focusing down towards the bottom of the cell. Looks like a flower now. So this is, a, I'm sorry, this is the top. You see the little flower, little cracks in the air gel made by the impacting particle. That's, that's amazing. And to actually see the outer edge of this, in a sense, impact crater, this, this crater, this dust has caused going into this aerogel is truly amazing. Now, how many um, impact craters like this or in, uh, per cell were there on average? Can you, is there an answer to that? Yeah, on the order of maybe 10 impact uh, uh, tracks per cell, there's 124 cells. So again, it's, it's more than 1,000 grains impacting the comet. Uh, and and uh, so Ron's moving the scope around now, trying to show you more of the extraction process. Uh, th this is a good time. Pardon? You can see the needle moving up and down. That little... Uh, uh, throbbing back and forth. That's uh, the needle moving up and down as it pecks into the air gel. So this takes hours and hours. Once you set it up, basically it just runs by itself. Um, and wh while this is happening, I could mention something else we haven't talked about. We mentioned that we have a, a tray, a second tray captured by the spacecraft that captured uh, interstellar dust grains, grains of dust from other solar systems. And that tray is in here too. 
And uh, those tracks are maybe a hundred times smaller than the tracks from the cometary tray. They're almost impossibly small, very hard to find. And so rather than spend uh, you know, our entire lives trying to find these tiny little tracks in the interstellar tray, we decided to let you guys do that. And so there's a uh, online program, it's called Stardust at Home, the little symbol at, right? And if you log in there, you can join the effort to look at these cells at high magnification and try to locate interstellar grains. So we've photographed uh, the cells from the interstellar tra uh, tray. We have millions of little movies focusing up and down in those air gel cells. If you log into, into Stardust at Home, you can join uh, more than 20,000 other people around the world who look at these at their home computer screens and try to recognize the tiny tracks made by the interstellar particles. And the reward is if you recognize one of these tracks, we name it after, you get to name it. Uh, in fact, the first, the first particle was found by uh, a paraplegic gentleman in Canada, in fact. Um, so that's a program that you can do in your school or at home. Uh, you can be a planetary scientist. You can join the world's largest planetary science effort to look for these interstellar grains. And that's awesome because one of our folks on the line, a solar system ambassador from Florida, says he has looked at a thousand samples and two were possible candidates, but they were found not to be cometary particles. But you mentioned someone from Canada actually did identify a particle, which is great. And I will send a link to that out to teachers as well. And one of our other schools, uh, Live Oak Prep, was wondering what those little dark dots in the sample were. Those are little dots, which are, which are imperfections in the air gel. Um, so these are manufactured on Earth, so they aren't perfect. So those little, those little scratches on the air gel, you see one there. There's little imperfections in the air gel. There's little things that were embedded in the air gel during manufacture. Uh, but the tracks look quite distinct. So it's easy to, to recognize those little dots as being just uh, uh, something from, from, from how the air gel was made and to, to recognize that they're not cometary grains. That's pretty easy to do. Um, so humans are not perfect. We tried to make the air gel as clean as we could for this mission. We did the best job we could, but we, we weren't perfect. So uh, those are just imperfections in the air gel. Um, you know, you, life's like that, you know. Uh, so again, there's little that's perfect in this world, I'm sure, and, and people as well as substances. And, you know, one of the groups also um, from, let's see, this was actually from Skinner. They kind of, they were wondering, what's the size of that aerogel block? And if a person were to, like, take it in their hands and squish it, could they get hurt? Uh, they're about the size of an, of an ice cube in your refrigerator, a couple inches across, maybe an inch, an inch wide. They're pretty small pieces. If you put it in your hand and you tried squeezing it enough, you could crush it to dust. And it wouldn't hurt you, but it feels kind of weird um, in your hand. Uh, like there's some weird grease or something in your hand. It feels like there's something strange in your hand. It doesn't hurt. It just feels kind of funny. So it's not dangerous at all. Um, it's not sharp. It wouldn't cut you or anything. It's not, it doesn't give you disease or anything. Uh, you have to wash, you don't want to wash your hands afterwards. Um, you could get it in your eye. That could be kind of nasty. Uh, you have to rinse out with water, but uh, it's not a hazardous material at all. Um, and in terms of composition, it's the same thing as, as window glass, basically, like you see in your car. Just a, just a whole lot lighter. So for the Skinner Elementary group out there, if your teacher has a little sample of aerogel, we never recommend uh, getting it close to your eyes and you would want to preserve it. So the less you touch it, the more you can preserve it. For those of you that might have actually a sample um, from uh, some of your teachers out there. I know I have a sample too. Yeah, it's a, you know, aerogel, uh, okay. air gels, air gels are around. It's used in a lot of a, uh, materials now so you can actually get it in fact there was a there was a high school science project to make air gel that won some science fair in Florida a few years ago so if you have a, a willing parents you even can make it in your kitchen amazing what next 
what else do you have to show us? We have about seven minutes or so before we kind of bring things to a close, but we'll still continue with questions. What else do you have to show us in there? Um, yeah, sure. So, so Carl is now showing you, this is a special microscope we use to take the movies from the interstellar during tray. <coughs> so again, I mentioned that we have this tray of, of the interstellar dust grains, but they're so small, we can't even see them in this lab very well. So this microscope was designed to take movies, millions of movies, focusing up and down at the pieces of interstellar uh, dust containing air gel. And, uh, you know, rather than have people in the lab spend their entire careers looking, searching for these tiny little tracks from your stellar grains, they're all put on the web. Uh, that was something that was invented at, uh, at the University of California at Berkeley. And so they use the same system to look for um, extraterrestrial life. It's called SETI at home. And they're about to use a similar system to look for prehistoric uh, bones in Africa from aircraft photos. But we use it to put online millions of movies taken by this microscope, focusing up and down, moving over a few millimeters, focusing up and down again at the air gel to go and start us at home online uh, and then start looking at movies. You can see tiny little tracks made by the interstellar grains. But uh, compared to the cometary grains, whereas we have a few thousand cometary grains across 124 air gel cells, for the interstellar dust grains, we had maybe 12 total tracks uh, across the same number of air gel cells. That, that means you have one track for every 10 cells of air gel, and the tracks are 100 times smaller than the cometary tracks. So you can see what a difficult challenge it is to find these tracks. I suspect that uh, when you guys get out of school, we'll still not have not found all of those tracks. So there's time for you to... Uh, to log in, uh, join this effort, and, and make discoveries on your own. And that's so amazing, Mike. Now, um, Casper Planetarium is wondering, how do you know that the particles in these interstellar, that these interstellar dust particles are from systems other than ours? Yeah, because they have labels on them? No, I'm just kidding. Uh, that's a really good question. In fact, we, in some cases, the chemical composition of the samples is so radically different than anything we find in our source system. That's one clue. Uh, also, the, the flavor of atoms can be quite different. By that I mean, uh, you know, atoms are made of uh, protons and neutrons, and uh, atoms of, of carbon, for instance, can have different numbers of neutrons, always the same number of protons, and those different numbers of neutrons make different kinds of elements. They're called isotopes. And the, the mix of isotopes of elements in our sun is apparently different from that in other solar systems. So here I am leaning over. But uh, uh, by analyzing the isotopes in these samples, which is extremely difficult to do, uh, it takes a lot of patience, people can, can ultimately work out uh, whether it's uh, grains formed in our solar system or from somewhere else. Uh, and that's super exciting because it tells us a lot about how stars form, how they die, and what's been going on in other solar systems. So without having to travel to the next solar system to get samples, we just waited until they came here. That's amazing. And that is a very complicated thing, of course. And that was a great question, Casper Planetarium. Now, um, we're almost at the top of the hour. And so for some folks that might have to go off to their next class, um, I want to make sure that I take a moment to, first of all, thank all of the folks, Mike, Ron, Carla behind the camera there, Melissa sitting next to me. I want to thank them for their time and for sharing what they have shared so far. Again, this is an extremely special lab that we do not bring people in, even extra special visitors that might come to our facility. Do very many people get into this lab, uh, Mike? My daughter got in. 
my daughter got my daughter got in uh, when she was uh, five years old. Uh, Stephen Hawking uh, visited here about ten years ago, so we do have special visitors in the lab. Uh, but for the most part, in order to keep it super clean, uh, it's very hard to get in here, as you said. But one way to get in is to uh, stay in school, become a scientist, and then uh, work here. And I encourage you to, to do that. And you know, working with people like Mike, Ron, Carla, and Melissa is, I have to tell you, they are a fun group. And again, I want to thank them. And I want to thank all of the groups that are on the line with us today for joining us to learn a little bit about Stardust and to see our curation facility. And we are going to stay on the line a little longer to see if there are some additional questions or things you want to look at. But for those of you that do have to depart, and that doesn't include you, Mike, or Ron, or Carla, or Melissa, but for those of you in your classrooms, uh, if you do have to depart, thanks so much for joining us. And again, we're going to stay on the line for a few extra minutes. Before some of those groups have to go, do you have any departing remarks for those that might have to leave already? Any departing remarks? I have, I have no departing remarks. Study hard. Stay off drugs. Carl, what do you have to say? Um, Louder. Bye. Nice for you to join us. not going to let you guys off that easy. Now, these guys are really fun. And they, and I mean, uh, how, ma how many years have you been doing? Rob, do you? Sorry? Uh, I've been working here at, at the Johnson Space Center since 1979. So wow. Rob, Ron's really old. I am. I'm pretty old. <laughs> how about you, Carla? 10 years. 10 years. And you, Mike Zielinski? Yeah, 35 years, but not as long as Ron. And you, Melissa? <laughs> That's why I didn't say the number. <laughs> <laughs> and Melissa's been here 14 years. So this is the type of job, once you get, you don't want to leave it. And so for those of you, again, that have to depart, thank you for joining us. For those that can stay on the line, I'm going to make sure we try to get as many of your questions answered. So you guys can't leave us just yet. Um, so let me see, I have a question here from Windsor Farm Elementary. And Mike, you might have mentioned this um, briefly, but what was the most important discovery that has been made through Stardust? Can you hear me? How about, can you hear me now or? What we say? I can hear you. Can you, did you hear my question? Yeah. So. Uh, I mentioned that uh, two important discoveries were the kinds of organics we found in the samples, for example, amino acids. Um, it's amazing those survived being captured in the air and what they did. Uh, and the second thing is, as I mentioned, that, that we discovered that many of the materials in the comet formed right up close to the early sun at super high temperatures, uh, which kind of uh, seems strange when you consider the comet is half ice, water ice. So it means that a lot of the things in the comet uh, formed right up next to the sun that somehow got transported out, you know, billions of miles from the sun to where they collected together into the comet as it formed. And that was a process that, that almost no one had imagined must have happened. So that was a major discovery from this mission. And we're still trying to understand how that happened. But it kind of all ties in with this idea that the, when the planets formed, there was a lot of moving back and forth. It was a... Uh, they didn't just form and stay where they were. They moved in and out. Uh, that seems to be a, something that's commonly happening in other star systems we see. You know, there are missions looking for planets. They've found thousands of planets around other solar systems. And uh, the idea that the planets moved around seems to be something that's pretty common, actually. So that was a major uh, discovery uh, helped by this mission, uh, which totally changed our view of, of the universe. You know, in terms of an other amazing material, the aerogel, LIGO Prep was wondering what other material was experimented with before actually settling on using aerogel for this mission? Yeah, that's a great question. So I came here in 1983. That's a really long time ago. And for the next 10 years, we actually were trying to figure out how to, com how to capture atomic brains. 
We used uh, we tried using Crisco oil. We tried using soap suds. We tried using styrofoam. We used silly string. <laughs> we tried all kinds of, of, of strains and wacky things um, before we sailed on, on silica aerogel. And that's still probably the best material we could use. But people, they, we tried all kinds of weird things, uh, different foams and soap and uh, uh, spun candy, cotton candy, all kinds of weird things like that were tried. Shot all kinds of particles at it too, even chocolate powder. Yeah. <laughs> I that's right. That's yeah. right. Yeah, we we shot we, we shot cocoa powder. Uh, anyway, it's a long story, but uh, we tried all kind everything we could think of. It took more than ten years to settle on aerogel, and then to get that developed into uh, something that actually would work uh, on the spacecraft. And that's so funny that you even say all those things because I sat here, I looked at Melissa, and I said, "Is he serious?" And she said, "Yes." He, they're very serious. And did we actually do experiments in our experimental impact lab with these uh, materials? Yeah. So a really funny, we have a we have a special gun that fires materials at really high velocity. Uh, we tried. We tested all these materials I mentioned uh, in that facility, um, including the Crisco oil in a can, including silly string, uh, cocoa powder, uh, all those things we tried. So that took years and uh, sounds like fun, but it actually was pretty hard work. And that gun can accelerate particles up to six to eight kilometers, yeah. kilometers a second. Right? They can even accelerate particles faster than we did in this mission, up to almost 10 kilometers per second. Um, those are actually a fairly dangerous thing to be doing in the lab. So there's all kinds of special precautions to take. But uh, those experiments with this gun in the lab were absolutely essential to prove to NASA that this would work where they give us you know, the money to, to do the mission. Didn't you shoot the gun on the bomb at Comet once? Too? They shot the gun. They also, they also white sands too. Yeah. So, uh, Ron mentioned that uh, we, even did, we even did experiments at, at low gravity. Uh, on the NASA has a an airplane that flies parabolas, and uh, for 33 seconds at a time, you're in zero gravity on that. Uh, they use it for testing experiments and to find out how not to get sick in space. And and we tried these shots in that airplane as well. And for obvious reasons, the plane's called the Vomit Comet. Uh, it yeah. wasn't much fun for me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we won't ask for details. <laughs> Imagine the details. <laughs> so here's a question from, from Front Range Community ah. College. And they are wondering, does aerogel have to be stored under special conditions? I mean, you opened up a drawer of aerogel, and they were in glass tubes. So does it have to be stored under special conditions? Does it react with oxygen? Is it stored in a special gas? Can you elaborate on that? <laughs> yeah, so it turns out it's extremely unstable uh, around water. And so one of the things in this lab is no fluids at all. Uh, we use alcohol wipes to clean things. We don't actually bring in alcohol in a jar. And no water is allowed in here. So water will destroy the air gel, uh, really humid air, We'll turn it kind of white. So the lab here is kept at a constant uh, kind of medium humidity. Uh, no foods are allowed in here. Um, except for that, it's pretty stable. I mean, it's been flown in space. It's stable against radiation, heat and cold, vibration. Um, it's very stable for a long time in all those conditions. And I have air gel at my office I've had for more than 30 years that still looks uh, as fresh as it was when we made it. So it's not especially unstable material, uh, unless you get it wet. If you get it wet, it turns into tofu. It looks uh, really awful. Uh, it also tastes really bad, too. So uh, tastes bad, unstable with water. Those are the two major things. And how do you send this material? You, send a, you can send a block of aerogel to a principal investigator or scientist investigating this. And if the answer is yes, how do you send that? In the mail? Yeah, by uh, like Federal Express or registered mail. I mean, remember, it, it traveled 4 billion miles to the solar system. It survived landing on the Earth at 300 Gs. So sending it through the mail doesn't really bother it very much. Uh, so here Ron's showing you a, a, a glass sandwich, a glass slide sandwich with a, a aerogel triangle inside. That's how we send them, just in a, a little glass prison. 
Maybe so it's in the turn the light off again. Do you want me to turn it off? Try that. Oh, there you go. That helped. Whoa! All right. Now, if you can see, yeah, but uh, not too well. Yeah. Probably need to turn that light back on again. Turn it back on. Yeah. Black helped the, the black background. There it is. You can see a little uh, little white triangle in the center of the slide. It's like a little fuzzy area. That's one of these little triangles of air gel packaged between two glass slides for, for a shipment. Um, and we, we store them in, in glass containers because essentially they're captured in glass. And so by storing things in glass and shipping them in glass, we're not introducing any kind of new contamination to the samples. That's why they're not stored in, in metal containers or something like that. Um, and again, they're pretty stable against vibration and impact. So they survive mail trucks and, uh, and delivery people pretty well. That's amazing. And that's so tiny. You can see out there how small that, uh, that is that, you know, scientists can use for some really good scientific uh, investigations. So we had another question actually from Challenger Learning Center in Maine, and they were wondering um, about the orbit of Comet Vilt 2. If it has, they're thinking, does it have like a 10-year orbit and has it passed by again since these samples were collected? Yeah, it's passed by more than once. Um, so the comet was discovered in the 1970s by Paul Vilt. Uh, it was the second comet he discovered, so it's Vilt 2. And uh, what happened was the comet actually had a, a different orbit before 1976. It was uh, in the outer solar system. But it happened to stray too close to Jupiter, and the orbit of Jupiter has swung it into a new orbit, passing closer to the Earth. So it's been in the inner solar system, orbiting around uh, yeah. about a 10-year period, just for the last 40 years. So it's passed by the Earth several times since we did our mission. Um, it would be kind of cool to go back here again in the future and try to, uh, to learn more about the comet. That's not going to happen anytime soon. Uh, So here's a, here's a really interesting question from Wilkerson Intermediate. They, a student in their group wants to know if you get sick less often since you work in a sterile lab sometimes. Yeah, that's a really good question. And the answer is yes. I mean, the air here is so clean. There's no pollen. So if you have any kind of uh, allergies to pollen or dust or animals, insects, no chance for that here. Um, and when and the suits, it's fairly cold in here because of the, all the air, all the air flowing through the lab. But with the suits on, you stay pretty warm, so it's pretty comfortable working in here. And you're right, uh, <laughs> no, no chance for disease. So if you have a cold, if you're sneezing, whatever, you're not coming in this lab. So you're not going to catch any kind of, of disease or anything else in here. But I think we, we haven't done any, uh, we haven't done any kind of study to find out if. Uh, People have lower indices of disease. Um, but I will say one thing. Uh, this is a, there was a meteorite that fell in Canada 18 years ago. And it fell in, uh, in northern Canada on a frozen lake in the wintertime. So this was the only meteorite ever recovered while it was still frozen. It never thawed out, even during atmospheric entry. And it turned out this meteorite, it's called Tagish Lake, contains uh, high amounts of water and organics, a lot like these comet samples. And we thawed out one sample in our lab for the first time to study it. Everyone caught the flu in the lab. And we sent a, so we sent a frozen sample to Japan for a study. And we thawed their sample out. Everyone in the lab caught the flu. So the question is, you know, did we all catch the flu because it was winter time, Or did we catch the flu from the samples? That's a good question. Nobody knows. No one's seen any kind of uh, fossils and meteorites or bacteria or viruses. But you got to wonder sometimes, you know. So we haven't gotten sick from the samples. It's going to be pretty safe, or pretty safe from, uh, from atmospheric contaminants in here. So it's a pretty safe environment to work, I think, for the most part. Well, and we're glad of that. Now, here's a question from actually one of our groups from Otis Field uh, with a student there who is wondering, um, uh, Otis Field Community School, before the stardust was caught, 
um, what predictions did you have about these actual tracks of dust? Did you predict this is what they were going to look like, or what were your thoughts prior to actually seeing them? Or, you know, we, we all the scientists working on the mission, we'd all worked with, uh, with meteorites before. And based on our work on meteorites, we thought we had a pretty good idea, a suspicion of what comet samples would be like. We thought they'd be all uh, organic rich, water rich, but nothing that formed at high temperatures at all. We th there, was a, there was even a chance that, that comet grains were entirely from other solar systems, would consist entirely of material like interstellar grains with really exotic isotopic compositions. Uh, and we had other guesses as well. And all of those turned out to be totally wrong. I mean, the comet, as far as you can tell, almost essentially entirely formed in our solar system. It didn't form only at the edge of the solar system where the comet was assembled, but, but from materials that, that formed through the entire early solar system, even close to the sun. Um, and we also had thought, based on our experiments in the lab, that the capture process for the particles would destroy a lot of the organics, because particles are hitting at really high velocity, they're slowing down the air gel, they're getting heated up during that process. We thought there's probably no chance we'll capture things like amino acids without destroying them. And that was totally wrong. Somehow we lucked out and occasionally capture grains at low temperature, somehow amazingly, preserving these uh, really cool organics uh, intact for, for study by organic chemists. So a lot of our, probably almost all of our predictions were wrong. Uh, and it's just, uh, it's just amazing to look back on how wrong we were. And that's why it's really exciting being a scientist you work really hard for something, and then you get big surprises. And it's those big surprises that really, really help you have sort of the hmm, scratch your head moments and want to learn even more. Great answer there. Um, so Creekville High School wants to know if, can you explain at all how aerogel is manufactured? Yeah, so it's, uh, it's made at high temperature and high pressure. They put a lot of organic materials, plus the silica, right, in, in, in the form of powder, and they cook it in an oven at high temperature and high pressure, and then they have to get rid of the organics, so at, uh, at uh, high temperature, they begin to slowly reduce the pressure, and the volatiles come out, they just bleed out, and you slowly reduce the temperature, and it's like a, a cake you bake in your oven. If you're lucky, you open the oven, and the cake's still sitting there, Sometimes you do it the wrong way and the cake flattens out into a pancake. So when they make the air gel, in order to make it really fluffy, it can be very hard. You have to get this, this heating and cooling process down just right. But it's not so difficult that you couldn't do it in your kitchen. As I said before, I know of high school projects where people made it in their kitchens. Uh, uh, you know, they had very, very understanding parents, but they could do it there. So it's not so very difficult to make it. Um, it's very hard to make it super clean and super light like we used, but people have made aerogel in their homes. Um. So we might have groups looking up uh, aerogel recipes after this session. That might be, I know I want to check, try to check that out. Um, here's another question, and, and two groups are asking this, both Windsor Farm Elementary and Front Range Community College, which actually has Angela Green Garcia there, who you, who used to work at this facility within uh, Astro Materials, but she's got a group of college students on the line with her. And they're kind of both wondering, these two groups, is there another plan for collection of cometary particles? Would they use aerogel again? Any, any thoughts on that? Yeah, there, there are several proposed missions to go to a comet and capture samples, uh, even land on the comet, maybe drill down and get some ice and bring it back to Earth. And so far, none of these missions are, are, are funded and official and actually happening. But uh, maybe in your lifetime, a mission like that will happen. However, a mission like that would take uh, probably a couple of decades. So the missions that are proposed now, if they were to start, say, tomorrow, those samples wouldn't come back until your children are in high school, maybe. So you're talking about decades before samples come back. Um, so this was, a, this was a mission that took us 15 years to get going. It took seven years to happen. That's 25 years and more. Uh, 
So if, if a, one of these missions in the future started now, uh, it would be decades before samples came back. So it's not going to happen anytime real soon. Uh, hopefully it'll happen. It'll happen again, but maybe not in the near future. Um, but you know, you guys are still young, so it'll happen in your, in your lifetimes, I'm sure. Probably all of since long retired. Uh, there are missions to go and capture uh, samples from asteroids, which are very similar to these comets. And two of those missions are happening right now. And in fact, both missions are right now orbiting their asteroids and are about to take samples. One of them, the mission that's uh, run by the Japanese, will take their samples next week. So if you watch the news, you're going to see news of, of two new sample return missions uh, analyzing or sam sampling asteroids in the next week, in the next couple of years, and returning the Earth with those samples within the next two years for one mission. So that'll happen a lot sooner than another comet sample return mission. And that sort of brings up another great question. Um, some uh, one of the groups was asking, "What actual astromaterials collections do we have in our facilities within Ares here at the Johnson Space Center? What do we collect? What do we have collections of?" Uh, lunar samples uh, collected by the Apollo astronauts back in the '70s, late '60s and '70s. We have some samples we traded with the Rush, the Soviets, the Russians. They had robotic missions that went to the moon and brought samples back. They have some of those samples. We have meteorites, uh, like more than 40,000 meteorites collected on the ice in Antarctica, also curated here. Some of those missions, some of those samples are curated in Washington as well, at the Smithsonian Museum. We have dust in the atmosphere collected for the past 40 years uh, by uh, stratospheric aircraft. Those dust grains are coming from uh, comets and asteroids and the moon. Um, we also have uh, samples collected in this lab here from Cometville 2. We have samples returned from uh, the first asteroid sample return mission. It's called Hayabusa. Uh, those samples are just down the hall in this building. Um, and then we also have samples of dust grains that smashed into spacecraft. So we send them on spacecraft to come back to Earth and they have holes in them or craters made by asteroid and comet grains smacking into them at high velocity. We have lots of those samples here as well. We even have samples of windows from the Apollo missions that came back and they were uh, subdivided to remove impacts from asteroids and comets. So we have all of those samples here and they're planning for samples from uh, uh, the next, next decade. There'll be samples returning from uh, two more asteroids and there's also a mission the Japanese are going to do, joining with the U.S. and Europeans, to sample the largest moon of Mars, Phobos. And that mission will come back in about 15 years with samples from the largest moon of Mars. Um, that's also happening right now, too. So our job here within Curation, we curate. If it's come in from outer space and we're part of a mission, then we're going to house and curate samples in our facilities. So we've got a lot of labs just like this. Some are more easy to get into than others, but uh, this one's pretty tough to get into. And uh, again, we're very lucky to have you all uh, taking us in there. Now I have two more questions, I think, Mike. Uh, and one of them is from Live uh, Oak Prep. They're wondering, have any presidents ever visited the lab? You mentioned Stephen Hawking, but how about presidents? President Pence here a couple of months ago, uh, he visited uh, the Lunar Lab, and I think in what? Oh, well, and we had displays <laughs> set up for him in the lobby too. So yeah, that's a, I think that's the closest we've had presidents come to JS to Johnson Space Center. Right. Most of them have come in the last forty years, but no presidents have come into the lab. I think they're they were scared of the samples, maybe. Oh, well, we had Brian May from the group Rock Group Queen. Here. Yeah, he came here. Uh, uh, we had Ron Howard and Tom Hanks when they made Apollo 13. We have uh, Jack Palance. Jack Palance. Nobody knows who he is. Anymore. I know Jack Palance. <laughs> oh, we had uh, Ryan Gosling here when he made the uh, first man, just here not recently, the the movie about ne uh, Neil Armstrong. And Alan Alda. Alan Alda was here. Yeah. So uh, all the girls went crazy for Ryan Gosling. <laughs> 
And you've actually even, of course, had many of the astronauts. Buzz Aldrin certainly has come to our facility and other astronauts. Uh, but I bet none of them got into the Stardust Lab. Is that correct? Yeah, they, had, they, were, they didn't want to bathe first. They were worried about that rule. Really, the closest is Stephen Hawking. He came in into the visitor's area outside the window. That's awesome. That's awesome. So a lot of people don't get to see what you all out there are getting a chance to see. Now I have one more question. It is a science question from Creekview High School. And, um, uh, and I believe they're a group of 12th graders. So they're getting ready to perhaps pursue some of their college careers. But they're wondering through your research, have you found any molecules or chemicals or elements that could possibly give us an idea of the origins of bacteria. Man, you gotta give me that, man. You're, you're talking. <laughs> yeah, maybe. So it turns out that uh, a lot of these meteorites we have here and, and the common samples we have here uh, contain uh, amino acids, as I said before. They also contain uh, hollow, kind of basketball shaped hydrocarbons. Uh, those are actually pretty common in these meteorites, organic bearing meteorites. So these were little hollow shells of hydrocarbons uh, that were raining down on the earth billions of years ago and probably floating in the early ocean. And those would have made great like uh, uh, condo condominiums for early life. And the first step towards life would be like a little cell to hold things in. So those were available in these meteorites. They didn't contain viruses or bacteria but these little, uh, these little hydrocarbon shells uh, were being made in space just naturally, non-biologically. That's really the first step towards, towards uh, bacteria, I think. So the first step towards those are available in meteorites. No one's yet actually found you know, anything living or a fossil in a meteorite. Uh, maybe someday, maybe you'll find one. Um, but the raw materials are all there. That's fascinating. Well, you know, with that, it's about 25 minutes past the hour. I think I've gotten the majority of the questions uh, answered uh, as you guys, and I, I'm telling you, these guys are a fun group. If you can't tell, they are a very fun group. I want to thank Mike. I want to thank Ron. I want to thank Carla. I want to thank Melissa. And I also want to thank Suzanne also on the line for helping to facilitate this session and for sharing some of the great science and work that goes on here. We couldn't have brought this uh, information to you without these folks. And so we hope you enjoyed learning a little bit about Stardust and seeing a laboratory that just isn't uh, accessible to, uh, to, to really anyone. So thank you all of you for <laughs> joining us today that are still on the line. Thanks again to all of you from our labs here for uh, sharing your expertise and passion with us. And we really look forward to connecting with you all in the future. Now, Mike, any last good words for our audience before we totally say goodbye? Yeah, if, if you're interested in science now, if you're interested in science now, I encourage you to become scientists. It, it isn't that hard to do it and it's really fun. And it's a great way to uh, to go through life. And Ron Curley? No, no. no. <laughs> so I encourage you to stay interested in science if you are now. Don't don't give up that that uh, part of your life. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> Same here. <laughs> stay in school. Not forever. <laughs> Well, with that, do stay in science. It really does provide some fun opportunities. Where else can you do things like this? So with that, thank you all so much for joining us. We'll officially bring this to a close, and we look forward to connecting you with you again in the future. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>